Whether you love the ESV, have never read the ESV, or are just curious about Bible translations, I want to invite you to consider, does the ESV live up to its stated aims? Much of the ESV reads like any other Bible translation, so to the untrained eye, the ESV seems pretty much perfectly fine. In the ESV's introduction, it claims that it is an essentially literal translation that seeks, as far as possible, to capture the precise wording of the original text. And as such, its emphasis is on word-for-word -word correspondence. However, when you start to look closer at specific passages, you will find that it's not always the best translation. The first problem one finds is unique translation choices in passages with women that change the text's meaning. Let's look at the ESV's translation of Romans 16, 7, where a woman named Junia is usually called an apostle. The way it translates at the end of the verse is really quite unique. They are well known to the apostles. Basically, every other translation translates this prepositional phrase something like in or among the apostles. And so not only does the ESV's choice not accurately represent the Greek, but this choice is also inconsistent with the way the ESV typically translates this prepositional phrase in toys followed by a dative noun. The ESV actually translates this preposition consistently and accurately over a hundred times. For example, Acts 15, 22. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers. Moreover, every time in Romans, leading up to Romans 16, 7, in toys followed by a date of noun, is actually translated among or in. In fact, in the approximately 116 times that this prepositional phrase, in toys followed by a date of noun, is used in the Greek New Testament, the ESV only translates it this way one more time. But the ESV's choice suggests that Andronicus and Junia were merely well known to the apostles, not well known among the apostles. The ESV is essentially arguing that Andronicus and Junia were popular, not that Andronicus and Junia were actually apostles. Let's look at Genesis 3.16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. This verse is another unique translation of a preposition. Notice that the ESV chooses to translate the Hebrew preposition L as contrary to. Meanwhile, virtually every other translation chooses to translate it for. Now it's possible for this Hebrew preposition to be used in a contrary manner, but this context doesn't really suggest that. Furthermore, out of the over 5,000 uses of this preposition in the ESV, the ESV only translates this preposition contrary to one other time. Now you may be asking yourself, why is this significant? Why does it matter that they changed for to contrary to? Well, this verse is actually pretty significant in the big picture of the Bible. In Ben Witherington III's Biblical Theology, he writes, Here is no endorsement of the notion of male headship over women. To the contrary, this attempt to lord it over women is seen as a clear result of the fall and the curse of fallenness. It is no accident that the patriarchal narratives come after these stories at the outset of Genesis. Patriarchy begins with the fall and the curses of fallenness, not with God's original creation design. But the ESV's change of this preposition from for to contrary to suggests that the fall of humanity makes women contrary to their husbands. Women not submitting to male rule is a result of the fall, instead of men domineering over women being a result of the fall. So just like in Romans 16, 7, the ESV presents a unique translation of this small prepositional phrase that significantly alters the meaning. But the problems are even broader than this. The ESV translates women and men and leadership in the Bible inconsistently. Let's look at Romans 16, 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Cancrea. Here the ESV translates diakonon as servants. While this word can be translated servants, this word is often translated minister or deacon. This is actually a problem with other translations as well, so here the ESV is not exactly unique. But nonetheless, the ESV doesn't translate this word consistently. For example, in 1 Timothy 3, 11 through 12, the ESV reads like this. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households 
well. First, in 1 Timothy 3, notice that here, when a man is seemingly described as a deacon, the ESV actually translates it as deacon. So for some reason, in Romans 16, 1, when a woman is described as a deacon of the church, she is simply called a servant of the church. But in 1 Timothy, when the deacon described as seemingly a man, he gets to be called a deacon. However, there's actually another problem with 1 Timothy 3, 11 as well. The ESV adds words and marginal notes that obscure the meaning of texts when women are in leadership. In 1 Timothy 3.11, the ESV has literally added words to fit a theological position. Notice that the ESV begins, their wives likewise, and the NRSV begins, women likewise. Instead of 3.11 talking about women generally, the ESV adds a possessive pronoun to make the text seem like it's talking about a male deacon's wife. And yet, there is literally no possessive pronoun in the original Greek text, no textual variant in some Greek manuscripts, no nothing. There is literally no there there. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me when you start adding words like pronouns into verses, you're not quite following this idea of a word-for-word -word correspondence. I don't know. You be the judge. It seems like to me there's a consistent strategy here. The ESV has literally added words to 1 Timothy 3.11 to fit a theology of male church leadership. And when there's an obvious mention of a woman in leadership in Romans 16, they choose to translate diakonos as servant instead of deacon, unlike what they do in 1 Timothy 3.12. Further, the adding of words in 1 Timothy 3.11 doesn't allow space for women to be deacons like the Greek text suggests. Now we began this video at Romans 16, 7, and there's actually a couple marginal notes there that really obscure the passage that we didn't discuss in the beginning of the video. The ESV includes a marginal note that Junia could also be understood as a male name, Junias. This is a serious problem because there was a time when many English Bible translations changed the name of Junia to the male Junias. Junia was a woman's name in the first century, and Junia is the name we have in the Greek text. And so scholarship doesn't really accept this idea anymore that Junios is the male name behind this word in Greek. There's a great and detailed book on the subject by Eldon J. Epp. Now this book is pretty detailed, so you need to know Greek to be able to understand a lot of it. But the book even details this changing of Junia to Junios in English translations. You can literally see historically when people began arguing that Junia was a man. On the left is the translations that understood Junia as a woman, and on the right are the translations that understand this person as a man named Junias. In the 1800s, Bible translations began claiming that Junias was the correct male name, and this continued for over 100 years. So it's really disingenuous that the ESV suggests that in this marginal notes that Junia could also be Junias because no one really accepts that understanding anymore and people didn't accept that centuries ago. The ESV further muddies this translation by suggesting in another marginal notes that the term apostles could be translated messengers. This is never suggested in a marginal notes any other time the ESV has translated the term apostolos, which means apostles. And out of the 81 times they translate apostolos, they only translate it messenger three times in the entire New Testament. In other words, it makes almost no sense for them to suggest this as an alternate translation. Amid all the inconsistencies in the passages that we've discussed in this video, there actually is a consistent translation strategy with the ESV. And the strategy is this, making sure that women are translated out of positions of power and men are translated into positions of power. Samuel Perry argues in his article, the Bible as a product of cultural power, the ESV editorial team made intentional changes in order to make various verses and passages about gender roles in the family, gender roles in the church, and masculinity and femininity more agreeable to complementarian interpretations. Meanwhile, most of the other English translations and the Greek and Hebrew originals present problems for complementarian theology and traditional gender stereotypes that complementarians hold. And so although I don't think that every translation is perfect, I think the ESV needs some serious revision because it's consistently inconsistent in its translation of women and men in the Bible. To use a metaphor to describe this, if the Bible is a deck of cards, the ESV editors have stacked the deck in their favor to get the intended hands that they desire. 
If a standard biblical deck is supposed to produce hands with queens and kings and jacks and aces, the ESV editors have ensured that every single hand you get is going to be a hand flushed with kings. Now what I don't want you to get from this video is that Bible translations are wholly bankrupt and you can't understand what the Bible actually communicates. In fact, there's loads of work that have gone into amazing Bible translations in many, many different languages. But we need to be, make sure that we recognize that translations are informed by people with perspectives. And those, those perspectives can sometimes skew the way that we understand the Bible and the way that people translate the Bible. And so when you read a translation, it's best to read multiple translations to see the differences. And of course, it's best to learn the original languages, but not everyone has that opportunity. So if you are somebody who is reading the Bible and studying the Bible, instead of just reading one translation, read multiple translations. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to drop them in the comments below. Please feel free to check out the resources that I have down there. If you're interested in what one interpreter gets right about the Bible, make sure you check out my video on Dr. Martin Luther King. Until next time, peace. Thank you.